Well, it's my, it's my pleasure to share with you today some research that I got to do on uh, biochar in the 19th century. And as we heard the wonderful overviews from Thayer and, and Gloria and heard about some of the challenges, uh, especially Gloria's talk, the biochar faces, it, it might help us to look back into history, um, see if there are any lessons that we can learn from the history of charcoal uh, and its use as an agricultural amendment. And there's quite a bit of history out there. Um, our story probably really did start in the 19th century, and I'm going to cover a few topics here, uh, beginning with the role of agricultural chemist uh, Justice Liebig, and then I'm going to talk about some uh, you might call them bloggers, people who wrote in the 19th century about the use of agricultural charcoal. And uh, then uh, there's a little story I have about charcoal in a campaign to save the starving Irish, the Irish famine. And then um, a, a big story about charcoal and the debates around the London sewerage question. Um, and then finally, um, uh, the concern that existed even back then about food security and charcoal's role in that and then I'll address some final questions. So Justice von Liebig was uh, really probably one of the first genuine experimental chemists. He, uh, at a very young age, he established a laboratory at Gießen in Germany that was the envy of Europe. People came from all over Europe to see his laboratory and see what he was doing. And he impressed a lot of people, including Alexander von Humboldt, the famous explorer, who was one of his mentors and sponsors. And he did a lot of work in agriculture. It was a very particular interest of his. Through his experimental work, Liebig established the well-known law of the minimum that states that plant growth is constrained by the least available nutrient in the soil. And he came up with this metaphor of the barrel with the spades, uh, that if you, it doesn't matter how much excess you might have of nutrients in the soil, if you're lacking even one essential nutrient, that will limit plant growth. These discoveries of his, and uh, including his work in isolating uh, compounds and chemicals um, that were new plant nutrients, these discoveries spurred a growing industry, a uh, fertilizer industry that mined and shipped huge amounts of guano, bone meal, wine, and other fertilizers from all parts of the world to fertilize the fields of Europe. This eliminated, in some cases, the need for crop rotations and fallow periods to replenish the soil. But one of the first things Liebig did as a young man was to uh, look at this question of what was the fer fertilizing power of soil. And there was, uh, you know, this chemical approach to agriculture was very new in, in the 1840s. The prevailing theories then invoked invoke the principle of vitalism. Vitalism was a doctrine that functions of a living organism are due to a vital principle that's distinct from physical chemical forces. Believers in vitalism thought that black soil contained an, a special something, an organic life force they called vitalism. And this was separate from anything that could come from dead inorganic chemicals. The theory was probably based on the fact that what was called virgin soil from recently cleared forests was very black and very fertile. Everyone knew it was fertile. And some of the earlier chemists in the uh, 18th century had actually extracted a substance from black soil, they called it humus. Well, vitalism, I, you know, looking into this question of where it came from, it may have come from ancient religion, that, that humans had, you know, almost forever, they had this concept of soil fertility uh, being uh, represented by a mother. It's something that they could understand. And so everywhere people worship this earth goddess, uh, earth mother. And in fact, these beliefs persisted way, way into um, what, you know, modern times. Uh, even today, it's really interesting. There are probably hundreds of examples of these uh, images in churches in Europe that are the mother and child, and they're, they're black. And the reason for that may very well be because black was the color of fertility. It was the color of the fertile soil. So, you know, leaving actually didn't agree with this idea of vitality. He thought everything could be explained by physical chemical properties. And some chemists um, might have partially agreed with that, but they still thought that humus was necessary for plants as a source of carbon. Uh, but Liebig looked at the, the 
the humus, and he said, you know, it's too insoluble actually for plants to take it up in their roots. And besides, plants can grow pure charcoal. That's dead, inorganic stuff. So obviously, this humus is not uh, doesn't have anything special, some vital property here that, that plants need. Um, and charcoal is even more re recalcitrant. So he concluded that a plant that grows in charcoal has to get its carbon from carbon dioxide in the air. But you know, soon, you know, Liebig was a man of science, and he soon realized that humus did have a really important function in soil. It could absorb and hold chemical fertilizers that would otherwise leach away. And he compared the absorptivity of humus to that of charcoal. He also wrote this. He said, charcoal surpasses all other substances in the power which it possesses of condensing ammonia within its pores. It absorbs 90 times its volume of ammoniac gas, which may again be separated by simply moistening it with water. Those words flew around the world. They were posted and reposted in agricultural journals, in the Americas and Europe hundreds and hundreds of times. And there is actually a very rich literature out there of writing about agricultural charcoal in the 19th century. And fortunately, we have all have access to it. It's uh, all, a lot of these journals have been digitized and they're up on Google Books, so you can find them easily. Um, and a lot of them also are, you know, they said reposts. So, uh, and then lots of comments. It's really kind of in a way funny. It's uh, similar to our blogging culture today in a 19th century sort of fashion. Um, and uh, another thing that Liebig published that, that got a lot of airplay was a series of hothouse experiments that gave these wonderful results. Uh, in addition, charcoal, for example, to vegetable mold, appeared to answer excellently for the gesneria and the coccinia, and also for the tropical aroidae and the tuberous roots. We soon excited the attention of connoisseurs by the great beauty of all their parts and general appearance. And a little bit more about how charcoal was uh, curing diseased plants in the greenhouse. People sat up and took notice of, of these reports. And as usual, the early adopters uh, of this idea of agricultural charcoal were the educated hobbyists. Here's a quote from the Horticulturalist magazine. My attention was first drawn to the influence of charcoal by the wonderful experiments of Baron Valdini and the propagation of plants and the facility with which cuttings were rooted in this substance. Its use became very general in Europe by amateurs and cultivators of plants. And here's a few more quotes from this literature. For two years past, I have used some 50 loads each season of refugees charcoal, and being fully convinced that it pays, I wish to recommend it to my rubber farmers. Applied to half an acre of early potatoes the last summer, the yield was 75 bushels of as fine healthy potatoes as could be desired, that sold readily for $1 per bushel, and yielded the best profit of anything raised on the farm. And then another fellow was traveling around the countryside, and he observed in the midst of the disastrous drought of last summer, I found a lot with its surface deeply and singularly blackened. Upon inspection, I found it thickly strewn with pulverized charcoal. The field presented a rich verdure, strongly contrasting with the parched and blighted aspect of the adjacent country. And I'll just give you just two more here. Poudrette which is night soil, deodorants with charcoal dust, is one of the best manures for the rose. Charcoal dust is an excellent surface dressing. It imbibes and retains moisture, keeps the plant healthy, and intensifies the color of red varieties. And here, this one is kind of fun, a dead rat, nicely buried in a cigar box so as to be surrounded at all points by an inch of charcoal powder, decays to bone and fur without manifesting any odor of future faction, so that it might stand on a parlor table and not reveal its contents to the most sensitive. <laughs> well, that is now, if biochar is going to be anything more than a parlor trick, people had to address the economic aspects of it. Because, as they said, most persons are perfectly familiar with the effects of charcoal upon vegetation. However, the use of charcoal as a fertilizer, though it is generally well known, its expense often precludes its use. So this was recognized 
as people went on and did their experiments with agricultural charcoal, that it was a great thing, but unless you had a pile of refuse charcoal around, or um, you know, access to fines from a charcoal production process, it just, it was just too expensive. Um, and there's a very interesting character who was really taken with Justice Leaving's work and saw, had a vision. And just like many of us today have these ideas and visions of um, synergistic uses of biochar that can solve more than one problem at once. There was a man named Jasper Wheeler Rogers. He was an engineer, he was Irish, and he was a humanitarian. Um, and he, he, the two problems he thought that charcoal could solve, actually three problems, was um, first of all, he thought that charcoal in Ireland, of course, had peat bogs, and at that time, there wasn't really a concern with conserving those. It was just there, and it was very abundant. And it was cheaper feedstock than wood, and so we thought, we can make charcoal out of peat, and we can use that for agricultural charcoal, and we could also address the Irish famine at the same time. Although the way of addressing the famine was not so much the agricultural use, it was to build this industry of making charcoal from peat that would employ the Irish, the poor Irish workers who had no money to buy food. And then his idea is they would take the peat charcoal and use it to clean up the sewage in London and Dublin and other large cities, and then it would go on to the fields. So uh, it was a great idea. And he started something, I said he was a humanitarian, he started a group called the Irish Amelioration Society, and he went around probably to uh, wealthy uh, folks who uh, had a conscience, a social conscience about what was happening in Ireland, and he raised a lot of money for his Irish Amelioration Society, now this is not a picture of Jasper Wheeler Rogers. I couldn't find a picture of him anywhere. Um, this is Phineas Finn um, from the Trollope novels um, and the BBC, wonderful BBC series uh, called The Palacers. And if you if you want insight into the 19th century politics and society, there's nobody better than Trollope. Uh, but I just imagine uh, this Rogers character going around to rich society ladies and asking them for money for the starving Irish because really there was a lot more, there was more going on to the potato famine than, than people realize, I think, today, in that the reason the Irish poor were starving was not just, just because the potatoes had turned to mush, it was because if there was food in Ireland, the food was being exported at that time to England and other places. Yeah. But the poor did not have the money to buy it because they were paid in potatoes. It's called the potato truck system, and it was really unfair because they lost all their money as well as their food, and that's why they were starving. So here's the peat charcoal works at Derry Mullen on Allen Bog in Ireland in 1850 that uh, Jasper Wheeler Rogers built. And you can see the uh, women are up on top of it uh, working as well. They're, they're using the heat from the kilns to dry the peat before it goes into the kilns to be carbonized. And uh, it employed 300 people. And it was a, a, a wonderful thing. Now, um, Jasper Wheeler Rogers had a lot of opinions on a lot of different topics. And of the sewage question, here's what he said about it. This explains really well what the problem was. The problem for the engineer to solve is how can 3,000 tons of town guano be returned daily to the disinfected soil from which it was chiefly taken with the least offense to health and with the least cost. Shall it be disinfected by water, earth, ashes, or any chemical compound? Under the present arrangements, some hundreds of thousands of tons of this matter lie in store in London, putrefying in cesspools, and percolating the streets, while the residue is thrown into the Thames at great cost. And this is what he was talking about. Um, by 1858, the problem had really come to a head. They called it the Great London Stink. Uh, and you know, the, the character, the, the monsters here are representing cholera, diphtheria, scrofula. Um, it was an epidemic that killed thousands of people that year of cholera. And this was the source of the problem. The irresistible flush, I call it. And uh, Rogers called it the sin of the rich. As you can see on the first picture there in some sort of castle wall, 
and um, you can see the little uh, the water closet there with the tube or pipe coming down. The rich had always used what they call the water closet, flushing the waste down with a bucket. Um, and then the other picture of a London tenement um, alley, you can see there's a, a sewer gutter in the middle of, of the alley there, but those were storm sewers. The city's always had sewers, but they were not meant to take waste. They were meant to take storm water. And the wealthy and the growing middle class in these cities increasingly wanted flush toilets, and they just flushed them right into these existing sewers and overwhelmed them. Well, Liebig, going back to Liebig, he was also really concerned with the, with the sewage. And uh, he thought that flushing was a sin of a different sort um, because you were losing the, the nutrients, flushing all that sewage to the sea. And he really believed that it would have someday serious consequences. So that despite his role in building the chemical fertilizer, uh, Liebig really had this misgivings about that and the consequences for food security. He said, in the event of war with America, when supplies of guano would cease, they'd never know. And this is how it was done before the flusher. There was the night man, the rubbish carrier, and they would come around at night with a pail and empty your, your cask in your house and, and take it away, and hopefully it would end up on a farmer's field. They called it poudrette. As the cities grew, and um, there was, you know, the, the farmer fields were further away, they had to do something to try and, and make it easier to transport all this stuff. And so they started manufacturing the fertilizer they called poudrette. Um, but then, as now, we had quality control issues. There were no standards. So here's a quote from the New York State Agricultural Society. There is no doubt as to the great value of a good article of poudrette. We make it by mixing with the night soil, copperas, charcoal, and muck. When thus made, it is a very powerful fertilizer. But the poudrette of commerce is a very doubtful character. I have purchased some and found it nothing more than the sweepings of glasses shops, or horse droppings mingled with dust and dirt. Such poudrette was of no account. And, you know, leaving, of course, was concerned with, with poudrette, and um, he acknowledged that it was a good thing that people were trying to do this, um, but he found that the manner in which this is done is the most injudicious which could be conceived. In Paris, he said, for example, the excrements are preserved in houses in open casts, from which they are collected and placed in, placed in deep pits, but they are not sold until they obtain a certain degree of dryness but whilst lying in the receptacles, the greatest part of their urea is converted into ammonia, and the vegetable matters contained in them putrefy. All of their solvents are decomposed. The mass has lost more than half of the nitrogen, which their excrements originally contained. So leave it at a recipe. He recommended calcined mud and finely divided charcoal. Those things would help preserve the nutrients in the human race. He also advised a manufacturer on a patented formulation that included soot, wood charcoal, seaweed charcoal, animal charcoal, or phosphate of lime, sulfates of manganese, and iron. So um, maybe someone will be manufacturing Liebig's patented formula of biochar uh, poudrette. Um, uh, Liebig also had read a lot about China. He never visited there, but he read a lot of reports about Chinese agriculture, and he was impressed. He said, the Chinese are the most admirable gardeners and trainers of plants. The agriculture of their country is the most perfect in the world. And the reason he said that, he said, is because the Chinese understood the importance of the most important of all manures, human excrement. But uh, the Chinese, we're not, as far as I know anyway, routinely using charcoal in their system. Uh, instead, what they did in order to make sure the nutrients didn't, didn't degrade was they employed a large workforce that quickly, very quickly moved the waste to the countryside. Um, and the, the statue here is a, a monument to the, the Chinese night men, I guess you could call them, the night soil collectors. Well, going back to Jasper Wheeler Rogers in the peak, that charcoal factory at Dairy Mullen. It's hard uh, to find, it was hard for me anyway to find a lot more information about him, but I did learn that in 1853, he landed in debtor's prison, and his estates and effects were confiscated, and so the kilns at Dairy Mullen were shut.
shut down. It, it didn't last. Um, but he, he was a hard man to keep down, and by 1858, he was back promoting his ideas. I had to win the day for charcoal sanitation. He issued a patent for a pneumatic toilet that um, could be used without water to dilute the human waste and uh, collect it for um, the mixture with charcoal and application to fields. But the upshot of this that is that um, charcoal did not win this fight. For his part, Levy had tried very hard to lobby decision makers in London about the, the sewerage system, he was very much against it. But uh, by 1876, a report to Parliament came down firmly on the side of hydraulic sewage systems. Again, the economic issue that concluded none of the manufactured manures made by manipulating towns' refuse with or without chemicals paid a continual cost of such loads of treatment. So looking at the past, it's been interesting. What does this have to say to us about the future of biochar? It is really good to know that biochar made a lot of sense to people in the 19th century, but they were uh, stymied by the economics. And we know that today agriculture is still, for the most part, based on Liebig's chemical principles, but we also know that things are changing. And today we know that we need both life and carbon in the soil. We also have a climate crisis. And so I'm hopeful that in the future, our attitude may change from this idea of get your carbon out of my atmosphere to something more positive. Help me get that carbon back in my soil. And maybe we're looking at a new vitalism Liebig once started an argument with Pasteur over fermentation. He said that vinegar was produced by chemical action. You know, that's where it comes from. There's no, there's no vitalism here. But when Pasteur proved to him that vinegar was produced by microorganisms, Liebig conceded the point that's how science works. And today we know that soil is much more than inner chemicals. It's packed full of life, essential for the growth and health of our food plants. In a sense, we have returned to the vital principle of agriculture. So I have one final question. This is really interesting. On his deathbed in 1873, Levy ordered his coffin and he directed that his body should be packed in charcoal and buried at Darmstadt. And I just, what was, what was he thinking? Why did he want to do that? Um, you know, did he want to preserve his nutrients for the worms? Did he think it would smell better in heaven? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's, it's a conundrum. So I'm really interested in hearing what all of you might think about that, that question. So with that, I want to thank you. Um, and I want to also uh, thank the Ithaca Journal for publishing my article, uh, Justice While Leaving and the Birth of Modern Biochar. And I would also like to thank the Washington Department of Ecology. They sponsored a lot of background research here um, for a forthcoming publication. Uh, chapter um, in uh, a report called Odor in Commercial Scale Compost Literature and Human Critical Analysis. So thank you again, and I welcome your comments and questions.